We have team members all around the world, whether they're contract, whether we fully employ them, that are are not working right now, right? There's there's no inbound travel to their country. So we've really had to think strategically about how do we bring business to them in a time where we can't bring people. You guys, I have been working on something for the last six months that has been such a giant project, but I'm so proud of it. I, I'm excited to announce that I've just released my book. It's called Touch Points, and it's the Destination Marketer's Guide to Brand Evaluation and Enhancement. And it is a comprehensive guide for destinations to look at their brand, evaluate what you've done, and make a very clear and detailed plan of action of how to fix it. And it's... Look, I'm biased, right? Because I wrote it, but I think it's so good. I think it's a great guide, and I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. And I wanted to tell you guys about it. It's available on Amazon. Search Touch Points by Adam Stoker, and you'll be able to get that book for your destination. And I think it's going to be, especially for, for anyone that is trying to look at their brand holistically, this is the book for you. So check it out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Stoker, excited to bring you another episode today. We've got a great guest. She is a tour operator, and we haven't had a tour operator on the show before, so this will be kind of an interesting take for everybody. Uh, But her name is Kylie Chen, and she is with Akinella Expeditions. And Kylie, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Adam. Really excited to be here. Oh, we're excited to have you. And, you know, we've got kind of a little tradition that we have for everyone that we have on the show. Uh, We we like to ask you first, if you could go anywhere in the world, which for you, you're very, very well traveled. So this might be challenging for you. But anywhere in the world you haven't been, your dream destination, where would that be? That's a hard question. Um, But I have a lot of places on that list. Most of the places you might have not heard of. Um, But two come to mind. Madagascar is actually... um, an island, off, a big island off the coast of Africa that I have not yet been to, surprisingly, and I've wanted to get there. So that's high, high on my list. And a second one that's very diverse, actually, Georgia, not the state, the country. The country. Uh-huh. Very unique place. It's kind of squished between the Middle East and Russia and Europe. And um, I have a lot of friends there, surprisingly, and they've been inviting me to come for some years. And it just looks like such a unique, beautiful destination, very uh, cultural rich. And so really, really excited to get there, hopefully in the next couple of years. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you a couple follow-up questions with those then. So with, with Madagascar, what is it? And I've, I've actually seen some really interesting uh, National Geographic shows about Madagascar and stuff. So I, I've got a little bit of context here, but tell me what is it about Madagascar that draws you in? So I I love to travel for three main reasons, the people and the culture. Um, I love like tribal traditions, unique things you don't see anywhere, but I also love nature. I'm I'm very keen on being able to, you know, sustainably experience um, wildlife and nature and be able to, you know, kind of be a part of understanding it and preserving it and, um, you know, continuing on throughout the future. And so I am fascinated with the lemurs, the baobab trees Um, in Madagascar. The landscape is so drastically different than really anything that you even see in Africa on on continental Africa. Wow. And um, I I just think that would be so cool. And it's the only place in the world um, that lemurs, you know, are indigenous. So pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Okay. All right. I like I like your Madagascar reasoning. What about, so you've got friends in Georgia. You said it's very culture rich. Uh, tell me a little bit about what your expectations are uh, in visiting Georgia. You know, I think one of the things that really fasc- fascinates me about Georgia is I do extensive research on a lot of countries, places I have been, places I haven't been. So I know a lot about them. But Georgia, because there's not a high demand from, you know, U.S. and Canadian travelers, which is our main market, we haven't done a lot of that type of research. So it actually feels a little bit unknown to me. But the the people that I know who are from there are some of the funniest, most welcoming, kind people I've ever met. And the stories that they tell are so interesting. I mean, a lot of there's a lot of ancient historical sites in Georgia um, that just have never been touched and just are 
kind of out there in the middle of nowhere. How cool to be able to see and experience that. A lot of, it's actually quite mountainous as you approach Russia. Um, Mount Elbrus is just across the border in Russia, which is one of the, okay. you know, it fights for one of the, the titles for the Seven Summit with Mount Blanc in Europe. But just the nature is beautiful and the food, great food. Um, and people, you just never hear about it, right? It's one of those places that it's desirable because there's like a adventure element to it yeah. because frankly, I don't know everything that's there. And those are the most exciting places for me to go because it really is an exploration. Awesome. Awesome. You know, we've done uh, well over 50 episodes of this show and I ask that question every show and I have yet to hear Madagascar or Georgia uh, as as the answer to that question. So nice, unique answers there for us today. <laughs> yep. Well, I'm I'm glad I could help with that. I I love <laughs> unique places, so um, it's it's kind of well, a fun past pastime. L- let's talk about places you've been. What what's your favorite place? And man, this is going to be hard for you because <laughs> you've been everywhere. But but just tell me if you, if you could boil it down to, and if it's not favorite, give me your most memorable place you've ever been. Yeah, I mean I've been to well over 120 countries, so there's something beautiful about each place, and they're so diverse. Um, Two of my favorite, honestly, um, Papua New Guinea and Ethiopia. And there's kind of a similarity between them. They're very different countries, but they have the most languages in the world, the most indigenous tribes, very remote areas. They're mountainous. So people are, you know, there are kind of those natural barriers that have prevented invaders and, you know, even people within the country from, you know, even connecting with each other. And so a lot of culture and tradition has been preserved. And both have beautiful, beautiful landscapes. So Papua New Guinea in particular, that's probably my top because it is so exotic yet so beautiful. And there's a lot of fear in going there because it's unknown. But the people are, once again, just so kind, so funny. I have great friends there now. And um, the last time I was there, I went for a special festival called the Sing Sing Festival where actually all the tribes in the Eastern Highlands come together. The government sponsors this, this experience. And it's one of the only times in the year that they get to meet others from other areas. And it's really, really cool to experience music, dance, food, traditional, you know, dress, which often isn't a lot. It's just very different than what we're used to experiencing and seeing in the Western world. And I think there's a lot of beauty that comes from that, a lot of learnings. Yeah. And um, yeah, like I said, I've made great friends there, too, that we stay in contact with all the time. Well, you know, it's funny, you've also provided new answers to the favorite places you've ever been. We haven't had an, either of those brought up as well. And we're seven minutes into the show, and I, I've got listeners I know who are already jealous of the life you have lived. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you've been able to go some really amazing places. I'd like to get into kind of your background and how you ended up doing what you're doing as a tour operator. Yeah. So my, my experience, actually, I spent most of my time as a child growing up in Northern Idaho. So frankly, as a, like, as a growing up, we didn't travel internationally. We traveled a lot in our state. I loved being outdoors. We were always on the river. So I grew up a very adventurous, you know, spirited child. Um, And I remember we had this map on our table and every, every dinner, we would play this game where we would choose a letter and we'd have to name countries, you know, that started with that letter until there were no more left. And that brought up a lot of conversation around what places were like, you know, what people were like that lived there. So my mind was always running and curious and I wanted to like actually go there and experience. So fast forward to um, going to university, which I attended in Utah, I actually played basketball for a couple of years and got to travel domestically quite a bit that way too. So I loved being on an airplane. I loved playing different teams. I loved even just going to new States. It was exciting. And you know, you can find similarities and differences anywhere you go, which is exciting to kind of be in that situation. Um, But after two seasons of playing, um, I actually um, had an opportunity to go um, and study at Oxford, Oxford and Cambridge in England. Um, Wow. Scholarships were available. It just, it made sense for me. It actually was on my dream list as a kid. You know, I heard about Oxford, you know, it was, I would love to go to Oxford. You know, I was one of those kids that always dreamed big. So I took the leap and my first international flight was on a plane to Europe or to England 
by myself. And I actually remember being quite nervous, even though, you know, it was England, English speaking. Now I think, why was I nervous? But, you know, your first time I was 20 years old. Um, it was ex- so exhilarating and thrilling. And so that was my first time abroad. And while I was there in England, um, I, I went a little bit early because um, I wanted to backpack Europe. So I spent about 30 days backpacking Europe with a couple friends from college. I wasn't by myself, um, but it was really fun. Like we didn't really have an itinerary. We rode the trains everywhere. We It really broke down a lot of stereotypes and barriers that I had in my mind that had been put up just kind of maybe growing up without um, a travel, international travel background. And I think that really set the stage for what I felt was accessible and what I felt was within my comfort level to do. And um, travel just became a part of, international travel became a part of who I was. I went on to spend time studying in Portugal, living there, um, backpacking through, still a student, backpacking through India, Southeast Asia, and China. And then as a new graduate, um, I was newly married at the time as well. My husband and I moved to Malawi, Africa (laughs) to live. Um, It was kind of in conjunction with an internship that I had landed right at the end of my um, time at school. And we spent a good half the year living in Malawi and were able to, you know, travel across borders, like overland in, you know, local chicken buses with our local friends that we had met to over a dozen countries. So my first three years of travel really was traveling like a local and being very immersed in the culture and the people and building beautiful friendships. And I think that set the stage. At that time, I didn't really know I was going to work and travel. I wasn't traveling because I wanted to build trips for other people. I was just doing it because I loved it. And the way I was traveling allowed me to build a lot of relationships with people that I now work with. So it was really easy when I made the step to say, I want to start a travel company and let's start with a couple trips in these locations. I know exactly who to reach out to. Let's see if we can get people on them. It started with a couple trips and then we grew from there. Um, But it really started out of a love of crossing borders that I still love today. It's it's my favorite, favorite hobby. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Well, you have seen the world. That's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, as a tour operator, it sounds like you started with a couple of tours, but I'm looking at your, at your website and it's acanella.com, A-C-A-N-E-L-A. And you guys, I mean, it's, it's funny because it says destinations and you click on it and there's every continent in the world just about. So tell me a little bit about your business and how it grew from those first couple of tours into what it is today. Yeah, I think, you know, when we first started, it really was, it's actually funny. Um, I sat, my, 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 my brother-in-law, we were visiting them on the East Coast, and I was trying to decide, you know, after school what I should do. I love travel. I had this kind of idea, actually, to start a, a spice company where I would bring, partner with these, you know, chefs and women that I'd met from around the world to create these spice blends um because i i loved cultural connection through food it was something that i felt thought was so beautiful around the world um i had this idea to bring the travel experiences to people through food and i remember my brother-in-law sitting me down and saying that's a great idea but have you ever thought about actually doing trips like i think a lot more people would be interested in that that's what people know you for and i think frankly he said i think it's a better business and i was like ah oh, I, I actually never thought about that i mean i was just fresh out of school early 20s I I didn't really think about me being able to do that. And so just that one comment was enough to empower me to try. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do one trip. I chose India. It was actually a bad first destination to choose. I learned (laughs) later. I chose India because I had spent a lot of time there and I felt super confident finding the right people um, to guide the experience. And we, I said, if I, if we fill this and if it's profitable, even slightly, I'm going to, you know, invest those profits into the next trip and just, we're going to keep going that's where it started. So the first trips were to India. I did one to uh, Finland, um, partnered with a, one of my friends who's a photographer. We did like a photography expedition later on Peru, Morocco. So I kind of caught on. I started catching on to places that people really wanted to go, but were afraid to go on their own, whether it was actual fear or just language barriers or logistical constraints. People didn't know how to get around. And those are the places that we started. And those are actually our flagship destinations now. So we go to over 60, technically 100 countries, but 60 of those are like our 
are most common. And of those, we definitely have ones that are we're known for, like Morocco, Peru, Egypt, safaris in Africa. Because the, the common theme between all of those is we've done them since the beginning. We have great relationships there, and they're places that there are barriers up for people to go on their own. And that's really kind of where we built like the core of our business around. And we just started, I'm a marketer at heart. I'm a visionary. I love sales and marketing. That's really, I love trip building as well. But right now, um, and when I first started, I was very much focused on how do we position these trips differently than what other people are doing? How do we connect with travelers? And we just started to grow the momentum and build a community of over a million actually in our community. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, this podcast specifically targets destination marketers, right? These are people within destinations. Their entire goal is to bring more and more travelers into the destination. And they work with tour operators like you constantly, right? Like they, they are trying to get as many people bringing group tours to their destination as possible. Tell me a little bit about what you look for in a destination And what the best way for a destination is to reach out to a tour operator like you? That's a great question. I mean, this is something I actually think about a lot because there are a lot of places that I've been that have really beautiful, beautiful landscapes, culture, food, everything you'd want in a destination, yet nobody knows about it. Or maybe it's not, you know, on the top 10 travel list. Um, Media plays a huge role in kind of, and airlines, right, in creating accessibility to countries and you know, you have the seven wonders of the world. There are all these things that are kind of in the media that create desire within people to visit those places. But I would say, you know, from like a, a tourism board perspective or, you know, local guides in countries um, trying to partner with tour operators or trying to just, you know, generate more interest for their destination, accessibility is huge. So, you know, the the climate of the country, meaning like, you know, the government politics, you know, how open is the destination visa wise, airline wise to actually access, that's really important. But also just bringing visibility around around the things that are unique. So like Guatemala is a good example of this beautiful country, they have, you know, um, Tikal, um, amazing food, Lake Titicaca, just so many cool, cool things. Yet, it's not on your top destination list, say like Peru, Machu Picchu, or, you know, Patagonia or the Galapagos are. But Guatemala is doing a great job right now in in bringing visibility around the beautiful things that they have, kind of those highlights that are easy to um, remember. It's not too much. You know, they have like three things that they're really focused on right now. And I'm actually starting to see more people interested in Guatemala. So we play a role in that as well. Large, large media companies play a bigger role, like your Forbes, Condé Nast, or not Forbes, Condé Nast, um, uh, CNN Traveler, all those things um, play a role in that. But um, really, it comes down to sharing the beauty of the country in a unique light so that people desire to go there. It's actually something that we're really trying to crack the code on. Yeah, because it's it's tricky. I mean, the easiest thing to do is to ride the curtails of what um, big media companies are, are doing, uh, like Condé Nast and Travel and Leisure. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I think that's great. Great advice is is the PR angle and looking at kind of the big picture uh, image that, that they have for, for travelers. One thing I'd like to dive into a little bit deeper with you is, let's say I'm a destination. And, and you know, I, I had a listener reach out from New Zealand a little while ago. And I know that they, they want tour operators to come. So let's say New Zealand, there's a destination Mm -hmm. in New Zealand that wants you to create a trip around their destination or in their destination. What's that process like? And and what do you need from them in order to know if, if that's the right fit for your audience? Normally what, what we would do in that case, if it's like a particular place in New Zealand, um, you know, we would, probably try to incorporate it into an itinerary that allows people to experience multiple highlights of the country. What we find is that a lot of people, when they travel to a country, they're traveling like they might not ever have the chance to go back. So they want to, at least our travelers, like expedition style travelers. um, So they want to experience as much as possible. So for us, the important thing in, in adding that, you know, specific place into our itinerary is, you know, um, 
great imagery um, experiences behind the location. So not just the location, but what can you do? What can you do there? How is that unique? You know, showcasing the beauty of the destination, the culture, the food is a big piece. Um, And almost tying that into how that changes travelers. Like, you know, people travel, yes, to see and to, you know, experience, but they're also traveling to change. They're traveling to make memories and take photos. That's a big piece of it in our day and age, right? To be able to, to make memories and capture those memories so that they can relive them over and over again. So being able okay. to position a place that way is really smart. Yeah, you're you're getting into to really kind of the meat of what I want our, our listeners to get here. Uh, because it sounds to me like, for one, if you're a single destination and you want a tour operator to come out, you're already at a disadvantage because these people, this is a bucket list trip, right? Yeah. And so you probably ought to partner with multiple destinations and put together a complete itinerary that would be somewhat life-changing for the visitor and submit those collaborative uh, itineraries to the tour operator and say, bring your people here because this is what we can give them on kind of a multi-destination tour. Is that fair? Exactly. Yeah. Especially if you're drawing audiences that are flying 20 plus hours to get there, right? Maybe if you're marketing to Australian travelers that can come over many times, you can position it a little bit differently. But for, you know, travelers that are coming from far, they're going to want that bucket list trip. So yeah, partnering to make that possible or being a part of an itinerary like that is what I would shoot for. And that's what we would look for in putting a new product together or a new trip together in a destination. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. That's good stuff. Really good stuff. Uh, Tell me, I mean, we'd be remiss if we didn't at least ask you, you know, how you've had to pivot your business in, in, during this coronavirus crisis. Uh, You you mentioned to me earlier that there's a couple of new products that you've created and rolled out. Uh, Tell me a little bit about that. I I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So we're in an interesting spot right now where our business obviously is directly halted. Nobody is traveling internationally. So, you know, that's what our revenue is, is focused on. So we've really had to pivot and it's actually been a great opportunity for us to try and dive into things that we've had kind of on the back burner for a while and know and knew we wanted to try. Um, one of those was um, product. We um, do trips and thus we have a lot of people asking us for what do we bring? You know, how do we prepare? And we've written a lot of content around that, but we've never actually dove into providing them with the things that they're asking for. So we decided, well, now's as good a time as any, because, you know, it's people are, you know, online looking to, to plan the future. So we dove into launching a few artisan products. Um, we had launched an adventure pack and we actually launched um, the, an adventure dress um, quite a bit probably due to my founding story, a lot of our audience are, are women, you know, a lot of decision makers and traveler travel are women. And so that really resonated well with them. They've seen me wearing these same dresses for the past five years. They really, you know, hit those two markets of, they look great in photos, but you can also hike a mountain in them. Um, So we just really kind of latched on to what we knew there was interest in. Um, We also, you know, launched a few um, artisan products in the home decor space, as well as brought back our spices from, you know, our original founding days. And it's been really interesting to see what has done well and what maybe hasn't stuck as well. Um, but yeah, re- overall really successful and it's going to be a part of our, um, our business indefinitely. And so it was a really good timing for us to launch that. And then we're also diving in, um, into the, the content space a little bit more heavy, thinking more of, you know, virtual travel, how do we bring travel to people, destinations to people that now that, you know, they would never visit, even if we weren't in the midst of a pandemic. So um, that's been really interesting. We haven't launched the first one, but we've already had a lot of great response. So places like Papua New Guinea, you know, places that you might not ever get to go to, why not travel there now virtually um, and have that experience? So it's it's been really well received and we're really excited to roll it out. We'll do other destinations too, like Morocco, Peru, that, you know, are a little bit more um, on people's bucket lists. Um, but yeah, we have some cool partnerships in place and we're excited to roll that out. 
Yeah, that's great. Tell me a little bit more about the the virtual trip that that you do for people. Is that would they would they have to pay for access to that, or would they? Uh, are you providing this on the website, generating great content so that more people are aware of you after the fact? Tell me a little bit about how that plugs into your business. Yeah, so we're yeah we're writing a lot of articles. We're also releasing weekly videos, short videos about specific destinations. All that content is free. It's doing really well, and we're trying now to reach a new, a larger audience through partnerships. So we're partnering with other companies in the space that are obviously struggling and looking for the same things and looking for these opportunities. But with the virtual travel, the way we're actually positioning it is quite unique. Um, right? We have team members all around the world, whether they're contract, whether we fully employ them, that are are not working right now, right? There's there's no inbound travel to their country. So we've really had to think strategically about how do we bring business to them in a time where we can't bring people. So what we've done is just so like Morocco, for example, we've um, you know partnered with um, or we're involving our guide, Jamal. Ramadan is about to start here in a couple weeks. Normally when you're in Morocco, you would pay probably around $100 to $200 just for the Ramadan experience. And so what we're doing is kind of a unique spin on that. The, the virtual trips are completely focused around impact. The idea that you pledge however much you want, it's only a dollar to get in. <laughs> you can pay $5, you can pay $10. There's different things that you get, like a postcard from the country written from an artisan, um, the, the, the things that you need to actually participate in Ramadan sent to your home. That's one of the levels. And the idea is that all the proceeds actually go back to Jamal and his family who are putting on this experience you norm- that you normally would pay $200 for, but now you can have it in your own home for $1 or $5 or $10. So it's obviously positioned really wow. well. There's a huge impact that it's having in families and communities. And our goal is to be able to just do that um, in all the countries, you know, that or most of the countries that we work in. And we might continue to do it even once this is over because there are a lot of people who, you know, it's not the time and space to travel for over a lot of factors and they could really benefit from having these experiences brought to them. So there's still a lot of things that we need to work out, but that's the kind of how, how we're structuring it, how we're rolling it out. And it's been being really well received right now. So we're excited to do the first one. Well, l- let me ask you this, because a lot of destinations during this crisis have uh, been building uh virtual experiences and virtual mm-hmm. tours and and giving people the ability just like you're saying to experience the destination remotely uh would you accept submissions from destinations for your audience to i mean this seems like a great time for destinations to maybe try to to provide you with some of their content and see if your audience finds interest in it with the hopes of eventually maybe having real in-person trips booked there Honestly, yeah, we would love right now we're we're really kind of identifying um, the formula that makes a successful, you know, virtual or digital experience. And what we're finding is that there are certain elements that go into that. But we also really want to bring unique locations, well-known locations, as well as less known locations. So now is a really great time if you are actually either of those, but in particular, maybe a little bit less known that people might not think about hopping on a plane and, you know, like traveling 20 hours to see that, but now is the time to bring that to them and, and, and get their interest. And, um, what we found is that there are a couple of things that we look for. So if there are some destinations that are interested in doing this, adding food, like a food element into that virtual experience is, is really important just because while we can't travel, our taste buds still can, right? That's right. one of the, we maybe can't feel or, or touch or smell, but with food, now we can taste, you know, obviously we can hear and see the experience. Um, but that's a big piece of it, as well as visuals. Um, you know, we're looking to, to bring destinations um, on these virtual trips where we actually already have a lot of the content or the people that we're working with have quite a bit of content or can get it just because there are a lot of countries in lockdown right now or, you know, you can't necessarily – have people, uh, you know, watch for two hours as you're driving to Machu Picchu. So we do have to kind of do some of the legwork in advance. So video content or just even clips is something that that we're looking to incorporate. Yeah, great stuff. I I would say for any destinations that are listening, you've gone to all this work to create these, these virtual experiences. 
what a great opportunity to send it to these tour operators that are are also having to modify their business or or pivot and send them those experiences and maybe that eventually results in new tour operators willing to book trips to your destination. So uh, yeah. kind of a, a way that's never really been approached before uh, in the industry, but but could be really beneficial for both parties uh, to add value to their end audience, which is the traveler. Yeah, exactly. People are needing needing experiences right now, needing places to go, even while sitting in their houses is what we're finding. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, Kylie, this is this is good stuff. I'm I'm enjoying some of the stuff we're going through here. Tell me about maybe a couple of the expeditions uh, that are your favorite that that you go on with some of your clients. Oh, that's a hard question. We have, I mean, I, I've already said it, but Peru, Morocco, Egypt, those are just I could go on those expeditions every month, every year. We just have a you know great guides. The, the destinations are dynamic. The accommodations are unique. They're boutique. The food is great, and you know we always get a diverse group of travelers. And it all all of that put together makes such a great experience. As well as there's a lot of opportunities for impact with those trips. We partner with a lot of great local communities and artisans um, that are directly impacted, you know, by these foreign dollars coming into their country. So. It's fun to see their businesses benefit from that. Um, so those are the three I would say. But personally for me, I'm a very like high adventure traveler. So I actually just got back um, mid, mid-March. mid I was actually flying home when the airports were all empty. Um, from oh, Utah. man. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I came back right after the rush when uh, the borders were closed with Europe and India closed their borders a couple days after that. So it was quite crazy. But Bhutan, I was in Bhutan and right before that, um, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and loved both those destinations. Also two trips that we do frequently. They're a little bit more focused around trekking. Kilimanjaro is obviously fully a trek, really cool experience with the safari tied and after. I, I love, I just, I, I, it's such a great experience. If you, if you are a hiker or love to trek, Kilimanjaro is just such a cool experience. So cultural as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, Bhutan is another one that I, I put on there that's kind of a new new destination on my list that I love to travel with our travelers because it's just, um, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to access. Um, just they, they really regulate travel, which is very interesting to see and learn about. But beautiful, beautiful destination. And it can be a casual trip or it can be more high adventure depending on what you want. And I like, the, dyna- I like the dynamic of that. Yeah. Awesome. And, and, Lastly, tell me a little bit about your women-focused trips. That uh, it, it, I was looking at on your website, and you've got that specific section for uh, trips for women. Tell me about that. Yeah, so we um, decided to do this. Actually, we, we've done them one off, two off in the past. Um, like I mentioned, partially probably due to my story. We have a lot of women that are in our travel community in particular of, of all ages. And what we've found is it's a it's an interesting, you know, dynamic. Often women want to travel but they don't have people to travel with. And so it's it's important for them to be able to join like minded individuals, other women, to be able to go to some of these destinations that they wouldn't go on their own. So this is like a a girls trip, but you don't choose the girls almost. Yeah. Yeah. People can (laughs) sign up. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So it's just, you know, only women on those specific departures. It's not capped on age. It's actually really cool because we get people of all backgrounds, usually well-traveled. So the conversations, but not always, not always. We get people who it's their first trip and that's really amazing too. Um, And we go very specific to destinations. Like we do, you know, um, Place it. We do all sorts of places, but Egypt, Morocco, those are common. Um, treks. We incorporate a few treks. There are a lot of women out there who you know want to be active and want to trek in a in a group with women. You know, just because it feels more comfortable, the conversations are maybe a little bit more relevant to them. And it's just we we like to be often with people that are like us. And so it's been it, it's been a fun way for me even to be able to connect with other female travelers out there and to learn their stories. And, um, I don't go on all those trips, but I, those are some of my favorite to go on. And I think that will actually be one of our largest growth 
avenues this next year. They've there's been so much interest in our in our women departures, and sometimes there are workshop element components like photography lessons or how to turn your hobby into a business. The trips that I go on, we try to incorporate some of that stuff or other. Oh, you've got me thinking. Women. I want to send my wife on these trips. This sounds like a blast. <laughs> it's fun. Very cool. Well, thanks for coming on today, Kylie, and sharing a little bit about your business and and uh, kind of the the current situation and and how you're navigating that, and also how destinations can can get involved. So, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I can talk travel all day, so <laughs> at any time I'm I'm willing to come. Um, and yeah, it's really incredible what you guys are doing. Keep it up, and um, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hang in there during all this. And, you know, I, I'm sure we'll have listeners reaching out to plan their their women's trip. I, I, th- I think that's such a cool concept and yeah. I'm excited to share it with my wife. Yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, this has been another episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We're going to post the link to Akinella Expeditions in the Destination Marketers LinkedIn group so that you can uh, learn more about Kylie's business and and follow up with her there. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll talk soon.